I'm Laura Lucas Magnuson, and this is The World Unpacked. major reshuffle of the Kremlin. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev has just announced that he and the entire Russian government will resign. должны предоставить президенту нашей страны возможность принимать все необходимые решения для этого. Владимир Путин, though, was pressing ahead with his constitutional changes. They were delayed back in April, you will remember, but now he's announced that Russia will vote on those changes on July the 1st. Amendments are up for consideration. One would link rises in the minimum wage to the cost of living. Another would ban same-sex marriages. But the most important amendment would do an end run around Russia's presidential term limits, allowing Vladimir Putin to stay in power until 2036. Early indications were that 70 plus percent voted in favor. Andrei Kolesnikov is a senior fellow and the chair of the Russian Domestic Politics and Political Institutions Program at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Andrei, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Today we're talking about Russia's constitutional referendum. Andrei, this referendum has been in the works for some time now, and there are quite a few issues on the ballot. I understand they're in a few different buckets. Procedural political changes, including the president's ability to remove a prime minister from office and the removal of term limits. Then we have social guarantees, including the changes to the minimum wage and pensions index. And finally, ideological issues, such as defining marriage to be between a man and a woman, enshrining the Russian language in the Constitution, and prioritizing the Russian Constitution over international law. Reading between the lines, what do these changes really mean? Uh, You know, no need to to read between the lines. Everything is um, absolutely clear. If we'll take uh, procedural uh, amendments, uh, in fact, uh, no major changes in the political system are envisaged by the amendments. Uh, There has been a slight increase in the powers of parliament uh, to appoint a prime minister and government, uh, but the president still plays a major role. Uh, This is all irrelevant in a fully authoritarian uh, political system where all decisions are made by an autocrat, and uh, other institutions are totally imitative. Much more important uh, is uh, the main amendment to the Constitution uh, with the goal to zero all presidential terms. It turns out from the new Constitution that in uh, 2024, uh, Putin gets the opportunity to run for another two terms. Uh, That is, in in theory, he can rule until uh, 2036 becoming like a Central Asian satrap or something like that. Uh, The other amendments only camouflage. Uh, The main one, also, it is important for Putin uh, to enshrine in the Constitution a set of uh, ideological values uh, close to him and his inner circle. The God, the sound uh, years uh, history, and the Russian people as a state-forming nation, such a special Russian uh, definition of the strange uh, phenomenon. Uh, social amendments uh, supposed to be the drivers of uh, the voting for the pensioners and uh, state-dependent categories of people. There are a lot of state-dependent people in Russia because of uh, the construction of uh, state capitalism uh, uh, here. We're recording on July 2nd. How should we interpret the early results that we're seeing so far? Uh, Results, uh, on the one hand, are quite uh, impressive, uh, you know. Uh, Nearly 70-78% of the population of voters uh, voted in favor uh, of the amendments and only 21% something uh, against and turnout was also quite good, uh, nearly 65%. It looks like uh, uh, the presidential elections of uh, 2018, nearly the same figures, just like it was artificial uh, result. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is really artificial, uh, artificial procedure and uh, artificial results. Uh, this is voting. It is not referendum. It means that it, it, it is not according to the constitution, paradoxically, to the Yeltsin's constitution of 1993. And this uh, where it referendum uh, has, let's say, a twofold function. 
Uh, first, it is a mobilizing event. Combine it with a victory parade celebrating the 75th anniversary of the victory over Nazi Germany. Uh, in this capacity, it is designed to stop Putin's rating downfall. And this is also an attempt to give more legitimacy to the decision to rule almost forever uh, and to share responsibility for this with the nation. Uh, Putin says, uh, this is what you, not only me, wanted. This is our common decision. You are my allies. allies. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly uh, the headline that the West focuses on, which is how this allows Putin to run again after his term ends in 2024 and allows him to remain in power, I guess, until about 2036. I also saw some reporting this morning that uh, it could eventually be for life. What's your, your take on that? Uh, it's evident that uh, Putin will not initiate this kind of uh, referendum if he, he will not uh, participate in the elections of 2024. Uh, and I think that it's evident. But uh, uh, the problem is uh, his future after 2024. And I'm not sure that he will not uh, uh, he, he will participate in the, in the next elections of 2030. It's too far away. Too many black swans uh, can uh, swim. Uh, it's, um, it's there are so many problems in in the Russian economy. Uh, the problem is that he tried to find an option for succession, and uh, he doesn't have a proper decision for it. Uh, he simply postponed the decision and uh, he decided that the only trustworthy person uh, he knows is Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. So he decided to be a successor of himself uh, for the time being. Uh, after that, after 2024, uh, he will see maybe somebody else could be so trustworthy uh, for him. So keeping his options open in a way. Um, and we'll get to what's next uh, in a few minutes. I think that'll be really interesting. You you previously mentioned that uh, the sort of nationalism piece where parts of this referendum uh, talk about religious conservatism, anti-gay policies, protecting the Russian language. Is nationalism a strategy or is it part of Putin's own ideology? Uh, I think both. This is a strategy in a, in a sense of political technologies because uh, Presumably, nationalism could be quite popular among uh, the majority of the population. We were recreating our pride. We made uh, Russia great again, uh, especially using such a tool as, uh, as the annexation of Crimea. And Crimea, cultural and historically, is extremely important for any uh, post-Soviet uh, Russian uh, citizen. But the imperialism is also very important, and uh, the annexation of Crimea, this is an act of imperialism, not simply of Russian nationalism, uh, such a strange mixture of uh, these two phenomena. Uh, and uh, this is partly, or officially, according to the new constitution, this is state ideology. So we have two constitutions under one cover. One of them, Yeltsin's constitution, prohibits any kind of state ideology. And here is a second part of uh, the constitution, uh, Putin's part, where the state ideology appears, uh, repeating, let's say, uh, the old um, Russian uh, ideology, maybe, or uh, set of uh, ideas uh, uh, which had been articulated by Count Uvarov in the beginning of uh, 19th century, Orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, uh, also known as official nationality uh, concept. So this is an example of, uh, let's say, path dependence in the development of Russia, such a sad element uh, of it. So at the end of the day, it's really extremely important for Putin to have this state ideology and to uh, fix it, uh, to, 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 to write down it in the constitution. Another amendment that seems particularly significant is the move to put the Russian constitution above international law. What implications does this have on Russian foreign policy or domestic policy? Who is this oriented toward? Uh, you know, it's more, it's more about uh, uh, domestic politics and some practical uh, uh, ideas, uh, such a dual-use uh, amendment. Uh, ideologically, uh, it asserts the sovereignty of the nation. 
very, very important uh, um, uh, part of uh, Putin's uh, vision of the world, sovereignty, security, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in practical terms, uh, everything is much more prosaic. Uh, I mean, it's a fixation of what is already happening. Uh, that is, it's an ironing out of the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights uh, when it benefits to uh, benefits Russian authorities. Uh, Russia is a leader. Uh, is a leader in 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 the number of complaints uh, to the European Court, Strasbourg Court uh, of Human Rights, because of uh, frequent violation of human rights and its insufficiency in that sense of uh, the Russian judicial system. So, and it it wasn't so uncomfortable to Russian uh, state authorities, to Russian courts, uh, to have all the time a lot of decisions which are coming from Strasbourg. Uh, so our authorities uh, uh, had to pay to, to people some, some fees uh, for the violation of rights. Uh, sometimes uh, Russia refused to implement the decisions of uh, the European Court, uh, but it wasn't fixed uh, uh, legally in the Constitution or in laws. Right now we have such a legal opportunity to refuse, to reject uh, any decision of uh, the European Court. Uh, but that is simply one, one of the parts of this uh, decision, and the ideological part is also very important. You know, there's sort of two narratives in Western media. One is, you know, Putin as all powerful, but the other is that, you know, issues like coronavirus uh, have actually weakened him somewhat. The results that you described earlier seem to suggest that you know, support for this uh, in the vote was strong for him. But what do you think these results tell us about the level of Russian support overall for Putin's presidency and his ideology? Or can you tell, given uh, this is somewhat to be expected, the results, I mean? Uh, you know, this is one of the main questions, why the results of the referendum are so high and why Putin ratings are not so impressive. Here is a here is an evident contradiction between electoral figures and uh, the level of support according to sociology. Um, these are two different issues. The real sentiments of uh, uh, the population and uh, voting results. Uh, s generally, so socioeconomic sentiment is grim. Uh, government assistance uh, to businesses and citizens was insufficient, uh, insufficient in the time of uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, since Russia has a personalistic authoritarian regime, the autocrat uh, takes all the good and all the bad, all the achievements in, in good times and all the problems in, in not so good times. Uh, that is why Putin's rating, ratings began to decline. Uh, to the anti-record uh, uh, levels, uh, to the bottom line. Uh, for example, Putin's uh, approval rating, according to the data of Levada's independent Levada Center, uh, fell from 69% in January to 59% in April and uh, May. Now in June, yesterday, uh, new results appeared. It's 60, so the same plateau which is, again, this is an anti-record uh, for, for Putin uh, in this regard. Uh, this rating has never dropped lower, only in uh, 2011 and 2013. Uh, there were months when 61% was fixed. It was all before the Crimea. So we are right now at the pre-Crimean uh, level. Uh, it, it means uh, that sometimes people are going to the polling station simply automatically and they are voting for power uh, considering uh, this procedure as, as a ritual or uh, civil duty, let's say. But the other part of it is uh, a lack of trust to uh, the authorities as such and to, to Putin paradoxically. Such a very, very special paradox of uh, Russian brains uh, and the enigmatic uh, Russian soul, uh, soul. Sometimes a person dissatisfied with the power can vote for it uh, at the same time. And we'll be right back to talk about how we got to this point.
Andre, I want to take a step back for a moment and look at how we got here. Putin first announced these constitutional reforms back in January, which prompted the instant resignation of the Russian government. What is your theory on why Putin made this announcement, despite still having four years left in his current presidential term? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, one of the main questions. Um, so hard to explain uh, the nature of uh, the behavior of Putin in that sense. Uh, there was a great need uh, for changes, great demand, uh, people's demand for changes. It found out we have uh, made a special research. I mean, uh, Carnegie Moscow Center and Levada Center, uh, we measure it uh, using sociological tools, uh, uh, the level of desire for changes, demand for changes. And uh, it found out uh, that it is unexpectedly uh, high. Uh, 59% said uh, last summer that they want uh, radical changes. Very uncertain meaning of these changes, but change anything in order to, to, to live better. So put in answer to this demand, he contributed to, to people uh, two kinds of changes. Uh, the first one was more, uh, more or less understandable, uh, the reshuffle of the government. So Dmitry Medvedev is not so, was not so energetic and uh, uh, so active uh, as a new Prime Minister Mishustin, who is uh, uh, the leader of a new kind, a technocrat, uh, obsessed by digitization of everything around him. Uh, so a very good person for uh, technocratic changes inside uh, this political authoritarian framework. And uh, the second kind of changes... Uh, here it is. Uh, uh, Putin will uh, contribute to you the certainty. He will be with us for many, many years ahead, and he will uh, uh, support, uh, uh, maintain a uh, normal level of, uh, uh, of stability in the country. Uh, you can say that this is not uh, kind of a serious uh, change, but uh, for Russians, maybe the this, this, this very fact of certainty is kind of a kind of a very significant and substantive uh, change uh, on the other hand Putin needed to let's say reconfirm uh, his personal social contract with uh, uh, the nation you know we know in in, 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 in American practice uh, uh, the word uh, uh, deep state but in, in Russian we have such a new uh, definition as as a deep nation, uh, which is which is talking with the leaders. This is uh, the invention of uh, Surkov, who was one of the main political manipulators. Uh, now he is um, he is not so so influential, but he invented this uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, connection between the leader and the deep nation. They are talking with each other without any kind of uh, additional bodies like parliament, like government, no need in it. Uh, simply Putin feels his nation. So uh, here is a contract. We, the authorities, are feeding you. We are maintaining a normal level of life, more or less. And you, uh, the nation, you are voting for us, and you do not intervene in our inner life, in our tricks, in our corruption, and so on and so, on and so forth. And it was actionable until uh, recent time. And uh, here is the question of uh, Putin to people. Are you ready to continue like this? Are you ready for this business as usual? And simultaneously, uh, yeah, sorry, this is a message to the elites. I'm not a lame duck. We're going forward. Right. I, I, I keep thinking what you just said about the, uh, the, the piece last year about radical change. That doesn't sound like radical change to me, but the certainty piece is interesting. I guess talk more about this tension between the idea that this is supposed this the referendum is supposed to enhance democracy, but also provide certainty because democracy doesn't always provide certainty. Yes, yes, this is an evident contradiction. Uh, we we can consider eternal Putin and eternal satrapy, eternal authoritarianism as as a as something which. Uh, brings more democracy to, to the country. But at the same time, Putin, Putin is ready to discuss democratic issues to explain that right now parliament will have more empowerment uh, if we compare it to, to the constitution of Yeltsin, something like that. But this is everything for the future. Right now, here is a grid need in law and order 
in instability and uh, when uh, Putin will go to a pension, will be retired, it could be the time for a transition to a more democratic uh, way of uh, ruling uh, this country. Uh, I'm deciphering uh, this logic uh, like this. But we must understand this, that we are living not in Russia, not not not, not in any any kind of hybrid uh, hybrid democracy or hybrid authoritarianism. This is pure authoritarianism, without any elements of normal democracy. All the democracy is imitative. You talked about how people seem to be voting almost automatically. They just go to the polls and vote, and are sort of used to doing this. Can we dig in some more to what these numbers really tell us about whether people are fully endorsing these changes or are just voting automatically? You know, this is all about uh, this very legitimacy. Putin thinks that this referendum can contribute something more to this feeling of legitimacy of his prolonged uh, period of of, of rule. So he started this referendum in order to increase uh, his uh, legitimacy. But here is a problem, another side of uh, uh, this big figures and uh, big turnout, which is uh, also something which can contribute evidences of the legitimacy of Putin. So many people are coming to the polling stations. Uh, And uh, by the way, people uh, who are democratically oriented and who decided to go to the polling stations and to, uh, who decided to say no to the amendments, they helped Putin uh, to create this feeling of legitimacy because uh, they contributed to this turnout. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of coercive and uh, forced voting among uh, budget-dependent uh, organizations. A lot of people were voting uh, with uh, the obligation to even to report to their bosses how they voted. And in that sense, forced voting could be an irritative, annoying moment uh, for a lot of people. And it could create a boomerang for the future when these irritated people will not vote next time for Putin or they could join uh, protests, uh, movements, protests, uh, meetings or something like that in the future. Not being... uh, uh, strongly politicized, not being democratically oriented people, but simply people who are expressing their discontent for this humiliation uh, with uh, this forced uh, voting which has taken place uh, right now. And it was absolutely evident that it was one of the main uh, instruments uh, to, to, to get these uh, high figures of voting and high figures of turnout. When we come back, we'll talk about what we should expect in Russia's future. Andre, Russia, like many countries, has been struggling with the coronavirus. Has the Kremlin prioritized enacting these changes over prioritizing the pandemic response? And what does that tell us about the regime's long-term outlook? Pandemic was extremely harmful for uh, Putin, uh, and as we see, it's quite harmful for dictators all over all over the world. And uh, sometimes pandemic was more efficient than even uh, opposition leaders like Alexei Navalny or somebody else in terms of uh, uh, evident har- harm for uh, the ratings of, uh, of Putin. Uh, and this is all about economy and uh, socioeconomic issues. Uh, a lot of problems inside the economy, uh, downfall of GDP, a downfall of industrial output, uh, contraction of uh, real incomes of uh, the majority of people. Very impressive figures, very impressive percents. And uh, uh, all the attention uh, was, paid, was paid to the economic issues during the pandemic, to medical and economic issues. And it was extremely important for Putin to return to the previous agenda, political agenda, to to the zeroing of uh, his terms, uh, to the sense of uh, permanent victory. So because of that, he exploited a historical topic, historical theme. He returned to the victory of the great, in the great patriotic war, permanently he he initiated this uh, this parade. Uh, he initiated uh, the opening of the 
main church of the of the R of the Russian army, something like that. He wrote an article uh, for the magazine National Interest about his personal vision of the history of the Second World War. It's it's extremely important for Russians because the only event which is still unifying people here, this is the victory in the Great Patriotic War. So he tried as soon as possible to return to this political agenda in order to mobilize people, in order to maintain a normal level of, uh, for him, a normal level of uh, his uh, uh, approval rating and uh, rating of uh, trust. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of long-term uh, outlook, uh, it means that he will continue uh, to fulfill. Um, to comp uh, he will try to compensate uh, socio-economic problems with some more ideology, some more historical discussions, uh, some more attempts to find uh, enemies, uh, external enemies, in, and domestic enemies. Of the fifth column uh, inside Russia. He did it all the time for many, many years, but now here is a moment to make it tougher, to make it more frequently. And he's trying to change the channel, but, you know, the pandemic is still raging. The economy is still struggling. So do you think that people will actually change the channel with him? Or do you expect that there will still be a lot of unhappiness with the domestic situation? Uh Again, it's it's not so easy to explain. <laughs> it's all about Russian psychology. People uh, are not ready to suffer in the proper sense of the word, but they are ready to consider to assess uh, every next step uh, down as a new normal, as it was after the year 2014, after uh, after the implementation of uh, Western sanctions and Russian counter -san sanctions, which were, were quite harmful for the economy and uh, for the level of incomes and uh, consumption of uh, average people and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, uh, we are ready right now to accept these new victories, this new stability, this new referendum. Uh, as a as a as a tool for uh, for business as usual, so we can we can survive a very dramatic periods of pandemic. Uh, we can't trust totally to to the state, uh, which avoided uh, direct payments to to people during the pandemic. But okay, we will believe once more. Uh, we will try to we will try to believe to 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 the state that it will come, it will uh, it will send us some assistance uh, packages uh, in a hard time. Uh, you know uh, that yesterday, in the last day of the voting, Putin paid special uh, benefits, special payments uh, for uh, for families with children. And I would say uh, that it could be accepted with gratitude uh, by the majority of Russians, uh, not to mention that there are a lot of really poor people or uh, lower middle classes, uh, people who are ready to accept this money. And this is an act of uh, benevolence from uh, the dictator. So let's go back to the question of Russian opposition. You said that the pandemic in some ways has done what they cannot. But might the pandemic embolden them in some fashion uh, and be an accelerant toward some of the changes they seek? Or do you see the referendum as essentially blunting that? Uh, opposition is witnessing very hard uh, time because uh, they can't articulate uh, their unified uh, mutual position about uh, primarily how to behave during this referendum time, because part of, uh, uh, I, I can't name this opposition, this, I, I prefer to name it uh, civil society, uh, part of the civil society uh, decided not to go to the polling stations because this referendum is illegal, it is not according to the law, to the constitution, and the very fact of the participation, uh, this is uh, contributing to the legitimacy of the regime. Uh, 
it's unacceptable for a part of for the civil society. This is, for instance, my personal uh, position as a, as a citizen of this country. Uh, the second position is, yes, here is a great need to go to the polling station and to de demonstrate your voice, uh, your discontent, uh, your desire to say no to Putin and to the zeroing of his presidential terms. This is the second option. And uh, this option uh, has failed totally because, uh, yes, people voted against the amendments, but uh, they demonstrated once more that they are minority or minorities. Uh, so there were very few, uh, uh, few protests, uh, for instance, in Moscow. Uh, there was very interesting action when uh, activists uh, at the Red Square posted uh, their bodies uh, 2036, uh, the last uh, possible year of uh, the last Putin's presidential term in, in the future. Uh, uh, they were detained, but uh, released uh, without any kind of uh, problems for, for them. In the evening, the same day, yesterday, a uh, protest rally was held uh, on Pushkin Square in Moscow. In, and in some well, some more big cities like St. Petersburg, uh, we, several people were detained, but it wasn't so serious and impressive. Uh, a lack of energy, a lack of uh, ideas, a lack of um, messages. Uh, but at the same time, I can I can say that opposition is responsible for such a weak answer to Putin initiatives. Uh, what could they do without parties, without organizations, without normal process of the participation in the political life? They can only go to the streets and how can you do it uh, uh, just right after the pandemic period, uh, violating medical rules. So it's, it's now it's impossible. And again, uh, this is a good time for this kind of mobilization of the supporters of Putin and Technologically, Putin did it quite good uh, in a perfect way. So w what is the future of the opposition? Uh, I think the same story. It's more about uh, civil society protests against uh, the violation and ab abuses of dignity of people. It is not so politicized. And Putin, in that sense, this is not a political force in the eyes of uh, people who are who are expressing discontent with his policy. This is all about dignity in different spheres, not only in political sphere, in the sphere of electoral processes or something like that. It could be ecological protests. It could be protests against um, memorial policy of uh, architectural policy of uh, this or that uh, Russian city. Uh, but it is still here. Uh, this, let's say, opposition or civil society didn't disappear totally, and uh, we could wait for uh, some more protests in the future, not only from the side of uh, liberal-oriented people, indoctrinated people, but from the side of, uh, uh, let's say, Karl Marx returns, uh, some social groups like workers uh, could demonstrate uh, their discontent uh, too, in some cases, in the case of uh, worsening of the economic situation. But uh, at the same time, I, I'm sure that Putin will concentrate on these issues uh, attentively. Andre, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The World Unpacked, produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're grateful for your listen and eager for your feedback. We welcome your emails at podcasts at ceip.org. And please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Laura Lucas Magnuson, on Twitter, at Laura L. Magnuson. These discussions are only made possible by our wonderful team behind the pod. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producer is Maya Krishna Rogers. We'll see you next time.